Russia 70 years later, the power of Marx's fusion of critical analysis and revolutionary practice was to be demonstrated. Here, it seemed, men were no longer the victims of history, they'd seized control of it. From Marx's historicist point of view, old-style religion disappears. The historical process itself becomes the sole redeemer. Nothing beyond history is invoked, and what the individual believes and does is no longer of cosmic importance. Only the objective process counts. This was philosophy for a democratic age, in which people emerged into great classes and groups. Marx's way of thinking is very public and objective. He rejects the view of life that starts from the individual person, and he rejects the traditional religious concerns. Agonizings about individual life and freedom and death mean nothing to him. But someone else a contemporary of Marx and also a critic of conventional religion, took the extreme opposite point of view. Any reformation which is not aware that fundamentally every single individual needs to be reformed is an illusion. The individual stands alone. The ethical reality of the individual is the only reality. It is not doctrine which ought to be revised. It is not the church which ought to be reformed and so on. No. It is existences which should be revised. Now, whole way of life is stuff and nonsense. In 18th century Denmark, one of the poorest parishes in the poorest district was Seding. It couldn't afford a pastor of its own and the parish house was let to a peasant family. Surnames weren't yet fixed, and they were nicknamed after their address, the churchyard. Søren Kierkegaard was by far the most gifted of modern Christian thinkers. At the time when Marx was in Paris, he was developing a new approach to philosophy that came to be called existentialism. The chief influence on his life had been his father, who was born here in the wastes of the Jutland Heath back in the 1760s, at a time when Denmark was still feudal and backward. Eleven-year-old Michael lived very rough, working as a shepherd boy and out in all weathers. Seventy years later, his son Søren recalled something that happened at that time. The dreadful case of a man who, when he was a little boy, suffered much hardship was hungry, numb with cold. He stood on a hillock and cursed God. And the man was not able to forget this when he was 82 years old. Young Michael Kierkegaard escaped from peasant life to become eventually a businessman in Copenhagen. He grew rich and retired early, outwardly successful, but guilt-ridden and melancholy. His second wife bore him seven children, of whom Søren was the last and dearest. But the wife and five of the children died, and the old man devoted all his energies to Søren. As a child, I was seriously and sternly brought up in Christianity. Humanly speaking, it was over. What a crazy upbringing. 
the depth of my melancholy was only equaled by the depth of my skill in concealing it. My one joy was that nobody could discover how unhappy I felt. I've never had any immediacy. And in the ordinary human sense of the word, I have never lived. I did not gradually learn reflection. I am reflection from first to last. After the naval defeats inflicted by Nelson, the old feudal and imperial order in Denmark broke down and the country modernized. It embraced industrialism from England and romanticism from Germany. At this time, Kierkegaard, still a student in Copenhagen, fell in love with Regina Olsen, then still a very young girl. But he saw erotic love and therefore his own wooing of Regina in romantic and theatrical terms, as a doomed, insatiable yearning after an unattainable ideal. The theme of the opera he loved most of all, Mozart's Don Giovanni. can be dangerous. Don Giovanni is punished for his excesses by being dragged off to hell. But the theatre is a place of paradoxes and transformations. With the death of his father and his love for Regina, Kierkegaard's view of his own life is about to undergo a dramatic change. Wednesday, April the 19th. My reserve and self-isolation are broken. I must speak. God give me grace. My whole being is changed. God's love overwhelms me. What he has done for me is indescribable. My father's death really pulled me up. I dared not believe that the fundamental misfortune of my being could be resolved. But now a hope has awakened in my soul that God may desire to resolve the misery of my being. Now I'm in faith in the profoundest sense. Faith is immediacy after reflection. I have understood the highest. That is not given to many in every generation. But almost at the same moment, something new rushes upon me. The highest of all is not to understand the highest, but to act on it. Kierkegaard loved to walk here in the Grib Forest. And finding your way through a forest is an old image for finding your path through life. When you come to a parting of the ways, you pause, reflect, and then strike out along your chosen path. Commitment brings you back into the forward movement of life. Faith is immediacy again after reflection. The trouble was that Kierkegaard himself hadn't yet found his own path in life. At the age of 27, he still had no career. His conversion basically reduced the options to two. One path led to marriage to Regina, a country parsonage, and an honourable but modest happiness. Half his soul longed for just that. Alternatively, perhaps he was required to develop the other side of himself, his strange personality and special gifts, in which case he should remain an outsider and become a writer.
an artist, a poet of the spiritual life. The meaning of Kierkegaard's whole life hung on the decision, and he now saw that choice is everything. Perhaps you can understand life backwards, but it has to be lived forwards. So, as Marx was to do later, Kierkegaard set out to reverse the traditional relationship of knowledge and action in Western thought. Reality is a process of becoming, action comes first. But whereas Marx had seen us as cooperating with historical forces, for Kierkegaard, the leading edge of reality itself is nothing but our own personal decisions. The choices we make settle what we become and what kind of world we're going to find ourselves in. So Kierkegaard's new philosophy of existentialism is a philosophy of action and the will. Life's chief task is to become an individual. But Kierkegaard lived in the first age of mass communications, the electric telegraph, the railway, the daily press. And he could see a time coming when most people would be spectators of life rather than actors. The many, the public, would drift and dream and watch the few. But Kierkegaard says no. You can only become an individual by action and decision. Faced with his own need to decide between Regina and that country parsonage, or the difficult life of an exception, an oddity, a writer, Kierkegaard sees that religious belief is not a matter of accepting reassuring information about how things are up there. It's a challenge to commit yourself to a way of life. Faith is an act of pure freedom by which we choose ourselves, choose our path in life. What is this self of mine? It is the most abstract of all things. And yet, at the same time, it's the most concrete. It's freedom. The consciousness of being an individual, which is fundamental in man, is his consciousness of eternity. Christianity is not a doctrine. It is an existence communication. It can only be expounded by being realized in men's lives. Kierkegaard made his choice. In a favorite metaphor, he was to become not a domestic goose, but a wild goose flying alone and high. So he neither married nor entered the ministry, but instead became a freelance writer, living off money left him by his father. The starting point for his writing was inevitably himself. He had to understand and explain his own strange personality, his relation with his father, and the reasons why he'd caused such pain and scandal all round by breaking off his engagement to Regina Olsen. Well, his archive is preserved here in the Royal Library in Copenhagen, and the papers alone run to over 40 volumes. We have journals ranging from 1834, when he was 21, right through to his death 21 years later. Kierkegaard had such a highly reflective and dialectical mind, it, it, he was so quick moving, that he could call up and explore within himself many different forms of consciousness and ways of life. As he says somewhere, I go fishing for a thousand monsters in the depths of my own soul. He wrote furiously, all day and sometimes through the night as well, standing at his high desk. Books poured out. In 1843, while Marx was in Paris, Kierkegaard published nine books in as many months. They contained the most detailed analysis of the possibilities of human existence yet done by anyone and they use many pseudonyms and a whole battery of tricks and other stratagems to deceive the reader into the truth, to lead him to faith. Kierkegaard doesn't approach religious belief in the old doctrinal kind of way. The reason is that he is all the time working from the human end. He's concerned with the subjective rather than the objective side of religion, or as he sometimes says, with the how rather than with the what. He works within the human sphere. He explores different possibilities of human life with the object eventually of showing that Christianity is the spiritual discipline that leads us to true selfhood, 
that tunes up our individuality to the highest pitch. And because he works entirely within the human sphere, the realm of our experience, Kierkegaard is also a sort of humanist. But he's quite unlike Marx because he puts no trust at all in progress or in history or in any human group. He's interested in nothing but what he calls inwardness or subjectivity, the quality of our individuality. Kierkegaard feared that in modern consumer society, the individual was becoming absorbed into the crowd, a mere member of the public. The spiritual life of the individual was being stifled by communal political and religious illusions. In a cheap age, the church had knocked down the price of becoming a Christian. Oh, Christendom is pampered with the nonsense that the Christian God is a decent and harmless chap, a good fellow, and especially a friend of female busyness and the begetting of children. All human effort tends towards herding together. Let us unite, etc. Naturally, this happens under all sorts of high-sounding names. Love and sympathy and enthusiasm and the carrying out of some grand plan and the like. This is the usual hypocrisy of the scoundrels we are. But the truth is that in a herd we are free from the standard of the individual and the ideal. So, millions of men live and die. They are just numbers. And the numerical becomes their horizon. They're all. That is to say, they are just copies. And Christianity which in the divine love wants every man to be an individual, has been transformed by human bungling into precisely the opposite. The New Testament consists of the demand to dare as a single person to have to do with God. We men reply, let us unite to worship God. The more we are, the happier, the truer, the more we shall please God. Christendom's guilt is really that it makes a fool of God, considers that he is a fool, lets him sit and wait in heaven and so plays at Christianity on the common or in theatres built for the purpose, called Houses of God. Much the same is true of the modern parson. He is a skillful, active, and quick man who finds it perfectly easy, with the aid of attractive conversation and bearing, to slip in a little Christianity almost without you noticing. What an abomination are these Protestant pastors who at most read what has cost others mortal struggles and then use it as purple passages in their sermons. My task is so new that in Christianity's 1800 years there is literally not one from whom I can learn how it should be done. For all extraordinary men who have hitherto lived have aimed at spreading Christianity. My task is to put a halt to a lying diffusion of Christianity, to, to help it to shake off a mass of nominal Christians. The worst danger for Christianity is not heresies, heterodoxies, not free thinkers, nor profane worldliness, and so on, no. It is the kind of orthodoxy which is hearty twaddle, mediocrity with a dash of sugar. In every way, it has come to this, that what one now calls Christianity is precisely what Christ came to abolish. During the year 1846, Kierkegaard was regularly ridiculed in a satirical journal called The Corsair. 
its caricatures singled out his spindly legs, his odd trousers, and his stick or umbrella. The cruelest cartoon referred to the unhappy business of his broken engagement to Regina. All this did nothing to raise Kierkegaard's opinion of the mass media. The daily press is properly calculated to make personality impossible. For it has the effect of an immense abstraction. The generation which has infinite power over the single person. The mass of men, of course, have no opinion. But here it comes. This deficiency is helped out by the journalists. Who live by hiring out opinions. If I were a father and had a daughter who was seduced, I should by no means give her up. But if I had a son who became a journalist, I should regard him as lost. The cruelty of the caricatures and the public mockery to which they led forced Kierkegaard into deeper isolation. But the fact that the world saw him as a clownish figure only increased his determination to counterattack. To the public, his writings with their huge cast of characters seemed a kind of theatre, just as the church seemed to be concerned with Christianity. The difference between the theatre and the church is essentially this. The theatre, honestly and honourably, acknowledges itself to be what it is. On the other hand, the church is a theatre which dishonestly tries in every way to hide what it is. For example, on the theatre board is always plainly written, money will not be returned. The church, this solemn sanctity, would shudder at the scandal, the offensiveness of writing this above the church door. The actor is an honest man who says plainly, I am an actor. One could never get a priest to say that at any price. It is lucky, therefore, that the church has the theatre alongside it. For the theatre is a wag. Really, a sort of witness to the truth, which gives the secret away. Preaching the gospel, parson and convert. You must die to the world, fee one guinea. Well, I can well understand that if I'm to die to the world, I shall have to fork out more than one guinea. But just one question. Who gets the guinea? Well, naturally, I get it. It's my living. For I and my family have to live by preaching that one must die to the world. If you are reasonable, you will see that to preach that one must die to the world, if it is done seriously and with zeal, it takes a lot out of a man. So I really have to spend the summer in the country with my family to get some recreation. It happened that a fire broke out backstage in a theatre. The clown came out to inform the public. They thought it was a jest and applauded. He repeated his warning. They shouted even louder. So I think the world will come to an end amid general applause from the wits who believe that it is a joke. By 1855, at the age of 42, Kierkegaard was worn out and the money he'd inherited from his father was gone. He collapsed in the street. He was taken to his deathbed in the Frederick's Hospital, where he refused to receive the sacrament from a priest and wouldn't see his brother Peter. There was disorder at the funeral, which greatly embarrassed Peter, who was a bishop. He long delayed placing a permanent tombstone to mark the grave. It was a fitting end for someone who was always an oddity, an outsider, an exception, a corrective, an individual.
Why did Kierkegaard end his life with such a savage assault on Christendom? He was attacking an illusion. The established church was supporting the rapid modernization of Danish society in the belief that the new liberal state would be a continuation of Christendom by other means. Kierkegaard said, no, that's a fatal error. The modern state is secular through and through, and a church married to it will end by losing sight of its own gospel. The problem of meaning and value is not going to be solved in future by the social order. We're not going to have God given us as our birthright. Rather, Christianity is forced back to its original starting point in the individual heart and conscience. Marx, of course, agrees that man has come of age, that the world is now purely human and secular, and that we face a consequent crisis in values. But for Marx, value is a function of our objective social relations. Change those politically, and the problem of restoring value to human life is solved. The divergence between Kierkegaard and Marx during the 1840s remains fundamental to us to this day. Some of us are instinctively political. To others, it's equally obvious that the problem of finding a philosophy of life and a faith to live by today is in the end a religious problem that can only be solved within the individual human spirit. But those who think Kierkegaard is right had better count the cost. In order to save the traditional sense of life's ultimate religious importance, he squeezed the whole of traditional doctrine with all its supernatural, indeed cosmic, conflicts within the narrow compass of the human soul. This certainly had the effect of heightening subjectivity, but at a price. The Kierkegaardian self remains a theater of conflict all its life. A human being must live in such a state of anguish that if he were a pagan, he would not hesitate to commit suicide. In this state, then, he must live. Only in this state can he love God. <laughs>